praise this afternoon in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we ask that you take absolute control over this service. Come among us. Anoint the teaching of your word. And let the lives of your people be transformed for the better. I command principalities and powers to lose their right of control over any life. I pray for open heavens in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus. Please take your seats in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, I want to um, speak to you on the power of the scriptures. The power of the scriptures. Every Christian must dedicate themselves to memorizing scriptures. You must memorize the word of God. <clears throat> you have to grow as a Christian, and one of the ways to grow as a Christian is the word of God. The word of God is your food, is the food for your soul, is the food for the spirit. And so there must be an intentional commitment to the reading of scripture and memorizing the scriptures. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 1 and the verse number 8. Joshua 1, 8. Now, I want you to bear in mind that it is God who was speaking here. And he spoke to Joshua and said, this book of the law, which is the word of God, shall not depart from your mouth. It should not, the word of God should not depart from your mouth. It means that if I meet you for the first time, after we speak for a few minutes, I should hear God's word on your lips. There are many Christians, you, you don't smell the word of God in their communications at all. Your daily language, your daily language, word of God is not part of it. We can't see the Bible says or hear the Bible says in your statement at all. The Bible says the word of God, God speaking says, this book of the law should not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Day and night. And it says, so that you will observe to do all that is written there. And it says, this is how you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It is God's intention that we become successful as Christians. But your growth, your success as a Christian is linked to your ability to read the scriptures, commit it to memory, and not only be a parrot that speaks the scriptures, but that you will observe to do all that is written therein. Young people are faced with many challenges. What will secure you against the dangers out there is the word. Somebody shouts the word. It says you shall observe to do all that is written in the word, and in that word, you will make your way prosperous and you will find good success. That means that there is a success that is not good and there is a success that is good. In the word, you have good success. That is the power of the scriptures. So for us to demonstrate the power of the scriptures, we must be able to commit scripture to memory. I came to challenge every one of you to have a project of committing scripture to memory. You should have Thousands of memory verses. When you stand, you can just recite them. And not only reciting them, but you want to also be able to observe, to do all that is written in the word. Amen. So the word of God 
is so powerful that God himself said for Joshua to become successful, he must be able to meditate. That means to commit it to memory so that without even looking at it, you can be thinking about it. Meditation is not having a blank mind. Meditation is actually going over the thing over and over, tossing it in your head, regurgitating it, bringing it back, swallowing it, chew it, eat it back, bring it out again, until it becomes part of you. And that is why memorization of Holy Scripture is so powerful. If you have to grow, and I want every one of you to grow, you must have a project of intentional memorization of Scriptures and application of Scriptures. You should have enough the Bible says, in your speech. When you speak to people, there must be enough the word of God says. You want to be like Jesus, check Jesus out in the scriptures. Anytime they come to ask him a question or he's talking to people, he will ask them, have you not read? Have you not read? It means he has read. And in fact, he is the word. He is the word. One of the second reasons why the word of God is so powerful, apart from making your way successful and prosperous, is that the word of God is a person. To the natural man, it appears like a book. To even some people, they think it's just a historical book of the Jews. But to the spiritually enlightened and the spiritual man, the word of God is a person. Amen. And John chapter 1 and the verse number 1 tells us that. Let's read that one quickly and then I'll share a few points with you this afternoon. But I want us to run a project of scriptural memorization. Memorize the scriptures. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the what? Oh, preach with me this afternoon. In the beginning was the word. Hallelujah. Word, W-O-R-D, not world, the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And that word which was with God, that word was God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So the word of God is himself. But who is this word? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That means that there's a distinction between this word who was with God and that word which was God. Because the word was with a particular person called God. Then this word too is also God. So that means that there is God and there's another God with a God. Are you here? Okay, so if we are talking about the Trinity, we have God. That is why I like to say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is one God who exists in three persons. This morning I gave you a few examples about the fact that the word Trinity is not seen in the scriptures, but we see that God exists in three persons. Number one, from the statement himself made by the time he was going to create humans. In verse number 26 of Genesis chapter 1, he says, let us, when you are reading your scriptures, pay attention to every comma, dot, everything, everything, because it will make sense. Don't just read it. it the scriptures are not just read for fun. It wasn't written for fun. Every statement, every, every punctuation means something. So in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And so when we go back to Genesis where it says, in God comes and says, now let us make man in our image after our likeness. Take note of the plural there. If he was alone, he should say, grammatically, it should be, let me make man in my image after my likeness. Why, why doesn't that ring a bell to you? That he's using plural. Let us make man. And he's talk, talking about angels. Because the angels were, were created beings. He says let us make man. In our image. After our likeness. So there is a plurality here. Even though the word in the beginning. 
God. Do you want to read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? It says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. In English, you see the word God. But in the Hebrew scripture, where the original word is, you see the word Elohim, and it is in plural, not singular. Elohim made heaven and the earth. This Elohim is plural. Now we see him saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So there's a lot of our there. Let us, our image, our likeness. Then, if we look at chapter 3, good, 22. Then the Lord God said, after they had sinned, and he had come to pronounce judgment, then the Lord God, see the Lord God, the Lord there in capitals again, talking about Elohim there, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Plural again. Are, are you all with me this afternoon? The Lord, the man has become like one of us. So we see that this God exists in more than one person. The man we created has become like one of us. And so throughout the scriptures, we see signs of that until we get to Matthew chapter 3. In the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And then read on 14. And John tried to prevent him. Say, I need to be baptized by you and you are coming to me. Take it down 15, 16. 16. When he had been baptized... Jesus came up immediately from the water. That means he had been inside the water. So we see baptism by immersion rather than sprinkling. There's enough water there if it must be sprinkled. John the Baptist would have just fetched a cup of it and poured it on his head. But he was put inside the water. Jesus came up from the water. So when you are reading your scriptures to understand, pay attention to every end for, comma, whatever. Pay attention. They all is communication. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. Now we have the Son of God right in the water there. The heavens were opened. Next verse. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon him. So now we have seen two members of the Godhead right there now. The Son physically is in the water. The Spirit of God is descending like a dove. And then another thing happens. Next one, quickly. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. You are either a mother or father to call someone a son. So the father spoke from heaven. This is my son. The son is in the water. The Holy Ghost was on his way down. So we see for the first time the manifestation of the triune God in one location. Are we happy? All right. So then when we know who the son is, and now we go back to our John chapter 1. So that we will begin to understand when, you see, in the process of creation, in Genesis 1.1, we see that he says, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God, the Father, said what he said what was his word. This is important so that you understand John 1.1. He spoke his word. The word moved and the Bible says the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, even from that verse, you will see the Trinity there. God spoke his word, it was a person and the word in communion with the spirit led to an explosion of creation. Now, in the beginning was that word. And that word was with God because he spoke that word. And that word was also God. Verse 2. He was now suddenly, this word is being personified. It was not an it, but a he. In the beginning was a particular word. That word was with God. That word was God. And suddenly we are being told that word was a he. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. 
Hallelujah. So without the word, nothing has been created outside the word. Everything was made by the word and for the word. Hallelujah. Verse 4. In him was life. So this word of God is a person. This word has life and the life was the light of man. Verse 5. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend or overpower it. When the word is grown in you, darkness cannot overpower you. And the Bible says in the verse number 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He, this man came to witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Amen. And then the Bible says, the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Verse 10. He was in the world. This light was in the world. This word was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Verse 11. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Who were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of God, but of God. And verse 14, and we beheld his glory. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says, and the word, that word became flesh. So the word is a person. I was proving to you the word is a person. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Full of grace and truth. I think the nice line which says, For the law came through Moses, but truth and grace came through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we can see from the word of God that the word was a person who became man and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. So when he started verse 1 by saying in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. By the time we get to verse 14, we have now identified the word. He's a person. And so when you take in the word, you are taking Jesus in. You are taking life in. You are taking power in. You are taking God, the Son, in. You are going to be full of him. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. And so it's very important that we begin to look at the word of God carefully and then we learn to memorize the word because that means that memorizing scripture is not just taking in some scripts, but you are taking in a spirit being. In John 6, 63, it talks about his word. John 6, 63, take us there quickly. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The spirit gives life. And the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus speaking here again. Said, My words, they are not ordinary. They are spirit and they are life. When you read the scriptures and you memorize it, you are putting spirit and life into you. They are spirit and they are life. And so because of this foundation I've given to you, let me give you a third reason for the power of the word and then teach you a few things why, how you must commit the scriptures to memory. At least, at least, at the end of your life, you should have at least 1,000 scriptures that you know it off head. That when God reveals to you in your old age when you're about to leave the earth, you just gather the family around and just recite 1,000 scriptures and just check out. What a befitting farewell. Just release them from your spirit. Amen. But the next thing is that the power of the scriptures is that it is the power of the scriptures that delivers us from sin. We are able to overcome sin when we have 
the scriptures memorized. That's one of the reasons why you must memorize the scriptures. And I, that's why this, the, the Joshua 1.8 account didn't only say that you must meditate, but it says you shall then observe to do. Because there are a lot of people that sin, not that they don't know the word of God says so. But when we have the word so much alive in us, not that it is analog in us, but it is digital in us, we will be able to activate this and know that God said no, so I'm saying no. I'm a slave to the word of God that it is a no because God said so. When friends put you under pressure to do something else, you tell them the word of God says no. And so I'm not, you are not God. When we're growing, that's how we behave. We tell our other friends, but you are not God. Why should I obey you? I obey the word of God that was there before you were born. And after you are dead, the word will still be there. It is the word that will judge me on the last day. Who are you to tell me what to do? With the word has not authorized me to do. But we must fear God to be able to walk like that. So when the scripture says so, it is saying to us that we must see to it that we observe. Now come with me to Psalm 119 and the verse number 11. It was a Davidic principle. David also learned it. We won't know whether he knew this before he sinned or after he sinned, then he realized this is what he should be doing. But in Psalm 119 and the verse number 11, this one, we memorize it from children's service. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That tells you it is memorized. He's not going to open a scripture to read that one. Thy word I have hidden it in my heart. In other words, he has committed it to memory. I have hidden your word in my heart. For what purpose? So that I might not sin against you. Amen. So in order for us to overcome fleshly temptations and not sin, the antidote is in the word. You must have the word in you for that purpose that I might not sin against you. If you don't have the word, then Satan can deceive you to say, we can get this done. And because you don't know what the word says about it, you will follow. But when you know what the word says, then you can't do opposite what the word of God says. And every one of us, we need to intentionally commit the word to memory so that we will not sin against God. Amen. The fourth reason is so that you will overcome the devil. It follows on from here. They are connected, but I separated them. You overcome temptations. Because you don't only memorize it, you must be able to speak it out. It is in the speaking out that we overcome the temptation. Because temptation comes, first of all, through our eyes and our ears. And then we begin to think about it. And if we don't shake it off with the word, we will find ourselves committing it. So it comes in through our eyes what we see because the eye is the window to the soul. So when you see something, you can commit what you are seeing. It can have a very strong effect on you. What you hear is also very important. It's another doorway to the spirit, the ears and the eyes. So what you hear and what you see can have a very, that, these are the two main doorways by which temptation comes. And so when they come in through that way, when we don't move them out quickly, by the word, the only thing that can take them out is the word. If we don't use the word, our brain will analyze it. As we keep on pondering over it, it will sink into our spirit. And then it becomes part of us. And the moment it sinks into your spirit, it will begin to move your soul. And your soul will begin to instruct your body to want to do it. And that's how temptation starts. So temptation starts from the mind. And it goes through the spirit. And then gradually, your body begins to act on what your mind is thinking. If you don't shake it off with the word, you will stay the same way. In Luke chapter 4. Am I blessing you this afternoon? Or I'm just boring you with certain scriptures and just talking a lot and it's just, just talking and it's just talking. Look at Luke. Tell somebody, look at Luke. It sounds very poetic, isn't it? Look at Luke. Luke chapter 4. Verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
Being filled with the Holy Spirit will not exempt you from temptations. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and he was tempted. Fasting and praying might deliver you from temptation, but it does not exempt you from temptation. You will walk into it. When Jesus fasted and prayed in that heavy atmosphere, Satan walked into it. I'm sure if he had a suit like the trouser like mine, he would have come with his hands in his pocket. Cool. He walked into that atmosphere. I mean, me, myself, if I pray for three days and three nights, the kind of atmosphere, I, me, myself, I can feel around me. And this is Jesus, God the Son. He had fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 days. You can imagine the power that is in that atmosphere. And Satan was not moved. He walked into it and he tempted him there. That means that as for you, you are no match. He can just walk in with a temptation. That's why when we are fasting, you see the greatest temptation. You wonder what is happening. Yeah, there are people calling fornication when we are fasting. Yeah. It tells you that the, the, the thing is strong. Satan, Satan was not afraid of Jesus. He came to tempt him and, and then asked for you. Oh, man, you need to pray. <laughs> you need to pray and stand firm. <laughs> Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. You, you're having two hours temptation, you are falling. 40 days, no stop. <laughs> In those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when the fasting was over, he was hungry. It's normal, isn't it? Yeah, it's normal. When I said we are fasting 6 a.m. to 6, you just, some of you are not praying, you're just looking at the time. When is it going to be 6? As soon as it's 5 minutes to, 5 minutes to 6, you have started eating. <laughs> you are eating as I'm finishing the last five minutes. Father, in the name of Jesus. <gasps> yes, in Jesus' name. Back also. <gasps> Three minutes. To, two minutes ah, it's now six o'clock. Glory be to Jesus. I finish hard. <laughs> Jesus too was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, Command this stone to become bread. You see where the temptation started? The same level at which we are tempted, that is the same level Jesus was tempted and the same method continues up to today. Satan will always tempt you in either all the three areas or one of the three consistently. You'll be tempted in your flesh. You'll be tempted in your soul. You'll be tempted in your spirit. Temptation of the flesh is to respond to fleshly desires, earthly desires, for youthful sins, fornication, sexual sins, the thing we are moving. Hey, what's that? Hey, it's not you. It's the hormones. It's the hormones. Like the feeling. Hey, you can suppress it in Jesus' name. You can serve God better. So you'll be tempted in your flesh. You'll be tempted. Everybody will be tempted. You'll be tempted. When you start relationships, you'll be tempted. You'll be tempted to commit sexual sin. You'll be tempted because you love each other. You'll be tempted. The Bible says that, and so we'll be tempted with appetites of the flesh if saw that it was good for food. And it was appealing to the eyes. So worldly things will appeal to us. We are in the world. We'll be tempted. But when the temptation shows up, so Jesus was tempted and the devil cooked it at the right time. He was really hungry. And that is the moment where he comes in to say, turn these stones into bread. After all, is it not that you are hungry? <laughs> hey, the King Kobe, the anointing that was poured on you on the day you were ordained. Charlie, we are fasting, but at 12 o'clock, you can do mighty signs and wonders. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? It is not because Jesus cannot turn the stones into bread, but whose instruction am I obeying? Are you here? So when we are tempted, it's not that we can't do what they are throwing at us, but whose instruction am I obeying? When you have that at the back of your mind, you will overcome every temptation. As I said in the morning, Joseph could have slept with Potiphar's wife. But whose instruction was he going to obey in the end? Because everyone whose instruction we obey, we become slaves to the person. That's what the scripture says in Romans. To whom you become servants to. to become, you become obedient to. That's one you become a servant to. So, in the end, when Joseph was finally honored, he was given a wife. He had children. So he wasn't impotent. But he knew when the right time is. But Satan will not tempt you with what is not appealing. He will tempt you at the right time. 
And so the temptation of the flesh showed up here. Turn these stones into bread. Jesus has enough power to just within a second turn those stones into bread. But he is not going to do it. He exercised self-control because if I did it, I have obeyed Satan's instruction rather than my father's. So there was a temptation of the flesh. The second temptation. So Jesus then says to him, but Jesus answered him. It is written. That's why I told you the word of God is used to overcome temptations and to overcome the devil. He used the word. It is written. Where is it written? If you don't know, at this point in time, there's no Bible to open. Memorize scriptures. Hallelujah. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God. Deuteronomy 6, 8. Every word of God. Every word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the Bible says, Satan then moves it on from the temptation of the flesh to the temptation of the soul. Then the devil taking him up a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And then in the verse number six, and the devil said to him, all this authority of the world I will give to you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whoever I will. Satan has a will. I give it to whoever I will. Anyone who worship me, I will give all this glory. And Jesus didn't say you are lying because the day Adam and Eve sinned, they handed over the lease of the earth to the devil. Because remember, we were created with the creative mandate of having dominion over all the earth. When we sinned, that was passed on to Satan. So he had the right. And for the first time, he spoke truth. And Jesus didn't say, you are lying. He said, all this has been given to me. You see, he didn't say, I created it. He said, he has been given. Who gave it to him? Adam. We hand over our rights when we sin. Your vision is lost when we sin. When Samson sinned, his eyes were taken out. Your eyes represent your vision in life. It was taken out. So the Bible says, the devil said, all this I will give to, to you, for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whoever I will. Look at Jesus' response again. Therefore, if you will worship before me, I will, all will be yours. This was a temptation of the spirit. So earlier on I said so. It's a temptation of the spirit. We are tempted in the spirit because in the spirit we are supposed to only worship God. For the father seeketh such to worship him. All that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Any other person demanding your allegiance for worship is wrong. No man should be worshipped and no God should be worshipped. We can respect pastors and honor them but we are not supposed to worship them. We are not supposed to treat them like gods. You are trying to take the place of God. Only he occupies that position. I was told about a pastor. Somebody, you know, one of his leaders was, was in the service and he's going to use the gents just before the pastor preaches. The pastor was coming and said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to use the gents. He said, you can't. You can't use the gents. I am about to preach. Sit down. Hey, Charlie. What, what, when did you become God like this? If God doesn't want us to use the gents when we are about to hear his word, why would he create the mechanism for that to happen at any time? But you see, when man becomes very arrogant, that's why God told David not to count the people. But you see the crowd, they just did, now you have become God. People can't do anything. People must stand until you sit. What kind of hero worship is that? Even the one who died on the cross is not treated that way. You, you, which cross have you died on? So, the temptation of worshipping any other thing apart from God was what Satan was leading Jesus onto. He wanted the worship himself. Any other person we worship, any other thing we worship that is not God is indirectly worshipping Satan. So, Satan tried to move him there but Jesus also knew his position. Again, the word. He had no Bible to open to. But when we commit the scriptures to memory, the Holy Ghost has a way of energizing the scriptures and activating them at any point in time when we are tempted. You, you didn't know what he's doing, but if you are reading the scriptures every day, you are storing up a lot of account of the word of God in your spirit man. And at the right time, the Holy Ghost will inspire one of them to deal with a particular temptation. 
So when that happened here, the Bible says, and Jesus answered. You must answer when temptation comes. Don't be quiet. Answer. <laughs> if you become quiet, you'll be quiet. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you worship. Amen. Or shall you serve him only. So he knew. Again, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 8. Jesus quoted from there. It's so clear in the scriptures. Jesus was making reference from his memory and was overcoming temptation and overcoming Satan from there. You don't just say, get thee behind me. You must have a scripture to knock him off. He only responds to the word of God. He doesn't understand gentle language. He understands the violence of the word. When you take in the word and it comes into you and it is released from your lips, it is very powerful. The word changes from being a text. It undergoes a spiritual change as you put it in. And when you release it, your tongue becomes a launching pad for the missile of the word of God. It hits targets and the devil will have to flee for cover. Jesus said, get thee behind me for it is written. Whenever you are faced with temptation, how, many it is, how much it is written do you have inside you? And when Jesus did that, Satan doesn't just give up. So he moved on to tempt him in the area of the soul. Let's go to that one. Verse 9. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle in the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If you are anointed, if you believe who you are, He's telling him to do something spectacular to show our pride. Emotions, our emotions, our, the soul is the seat of our emotions and pride. When we are tempted in our soul, we want to show off. We want to show, do something for people to see. Put something on display if you are the son of God. And Satan kept using these words because he's a created being. He doesn't know all things. He could just guess and check out and say, I think you might be that one. That's why I came to tempt you because this 40 days and 40 nights of intercession over there. I have lived here. I have lived here for a very long time before any human being came on this earth. And I know that I have seen the intercessions of Abraham and that of Isaac and Jacob. I have seen the intercessions of Elijah and Elisha. I have seen that of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, all of them. The kind of prayer going on there for the past 40 days and 40 nights. All the demons and principalities I sent, they all returned back to headquarters and said, Master, this one is beyond anything. You yourself go and check it out. And I came to check out and I suspect that you might be that one that he talked about in Genesis chapter 3, that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. I'm not sure which location but in case you are that son of God show it and Jesus was wise I won't go to show you it's not yet time for you to recognize who I am if you come tell who I am well I don't mind I don't take instructions for you he said for then Satan led him and Satan also quoted the scripture he also said to him quoting Psalm 91 verse 11 word for word and said ah, I have seen that you have used two scriptures to kick me off me too I'm also going to quote the scriptures to you I want you to know that he's also he said in his word for he shall give his angels charge over thee lest you dash your feet against a stone jump Jesus do something let's see he also quoted the scripture back. Jesus answered and said, it has also been said in the word of God. Hallelujah. That you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Hallelujah. That means the Lord our God is the one standing there. He indirectly identified himself but Satan is too dumb to detect it. He said you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He also had a counter scripture. What counter scripture do you have when Satan tries to bring in the counterfeit? Because Satan will always, when it comes to sexual temptation, one of the major scriptures he will use for you is 1 John 1, 9. Oh, Nancy, let's just do it. In fact, the scripture says that if we confess our sins, the Lord God Almighty, he shall forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You shall also counter it back by quoting Romans 6, 1. Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Ah, hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Satan knows how to mess the scriptures. He has been in heaven before. He has worked with God before. He knows the word of God. He can turn it around. If he can quote the word without looking into scripture to tempt Jesus, then you must have the word of God inside you so you can counter what he's saying. Somebody shout, I believe. What shall I say? Shall I continue to sin? That grace may abound. I don't want to lose grace. 
I don't want to lose grace. Hey, if I'm in the act right now and the rapture happened, brother, what are we going to do? Ask him that question when the temptation comes. Brother, what you, you, what you are saying, you understand. Oh, me too, my body is feeling for the thing. But what if the rapture takes place now? For he shall come at a time no one knows. And the hour no one knows. I don't want to lose grace. Hey, that you have been left behind. That the rapture has taken place when I'm looking in the spirit. Where are all my members? Hey, where is she? She, oh my God. How did you end up like that? No proton should be left behind. Because when they crown him Lord of Lords and King of Kings, we want to come in a Jama style. All protons, we will gather in heaven and say, Lord, wait for us. We are coming. We are coming. He said, Michael and the rest are all ready for worship. He said, we are coming to protonize heaven. We are coming with some heavy weapon. We are coming with some praises. We are coming with some worship, Lord. We have washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. We are the sons of God. We are the daughters of God, we have washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Wow, we have got the word. So memorize the scriptures so you can counter Satan's counterfeit in Jesus' name. Now, you see, God's word is the standard for the youth who want to please their king. God's word. And that's why you must read the scriptures and memorize the scriptures. My position has always been, if Satan knows the word of God, <laughs> off head, without reading Bible, how can I defeat him if I don't know the word off head? It will be a very one-sided match. You know, those who invent computer viruses are computer scientists. Isn't it? Nobody who doesn't know computers can actually create the virus to try to mess up your system. If somebody manufactures a poison, the person must be a scientist to know the effect of the poison in your body to design that. The secret service of many countries, especially the Mossad. You know the Mossad? They are the secret service of the Israeli yeah, they are champions in the world. If they choose not to mind you, then they have just decided not to mind you. But you can be president or you can just come and assassinate you. They can come. <laughs> yeah. See all the noise of the terrorist countries. They have, come, they have come quiet. When they started eliminating their top brass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, diplomacy have to set in. I think the last one that stopped, it was a Hamas leader. He was on holiday in Dubai. They went to his hotel and just finished him off. Where were all the security? Because they came with different passports. They have been there. They've been waiting for him. He didn't know. They think they have intelligence. They don't. It's just one touch, one injection to his neck is finished. They left him there. The people came. They cannot undo. The chemistry is heavy. You can't just undo. You can't. The titration won't work. The end point won't work. The guys are champions. Don't trouble them. <laughs> Don't trouble them. So because Satan can twist the scriptures to lure us into sin, we must be masters at the word. And when you have the word, the Holy Spirit who inspire the word inside you. Have I blessed you this afternoon? So God's word is the standard for you. You must commit the text of scripture to memory so that your spiritual life will be activated.
The next thing that happens when we commit the scriptures to memory is that you build a wall of scriptures around you and you will see that the world cannot break it down. You build a wall of scriptures around you. The advantage of memorizing scripture is that you build a wall of scriptures around you and the world will not be able to break it down. May you imagine that, that you have a wall of scriptures around you. We, what, what is the world going to put through to go through this defense? What offer are they going to offer which the word of God is not going to counter? What fear is it going to put into you when the word of God has said that God has not given me a spirit of fear? You fear, you yourself, you're afraid of me. See, many of us, we have become afraid because we don't know who we are. But it is the word of God that will tell you who you are. That's why some scriptures, you have to memorize them aloud. Please, this thing is warfare, so don't be diplomatic with it. When the devil is harassing you every day with thoughts of fear, don't just wake up and say, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my strength, my God, and my rock. In him will I trust. For surely he shall deliver me from the noise of pestilence, from the destruction that lies at noonday. He said, a thousand shall fall by my side, and ten thousand by my right hand. Okay. Oh, yes, okay. Look, when you are dealing with the devil, you can't just be quoting scripture, mobo, 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 like that. Pitiful scriptures. The, the thing is warfare. Let people say you are mad, but you know what you are dealing with. You lift your voice and say, Satan, this is your final warning in this house. You shall not threaten my life because I am created in the image of God. After the likeness of God, you have been defeated on the cross 2,000 years ago. If you try to remind me of my past, I will remind you of your future. It is going to be in hellfire and the lake of fire. You can't threaten me, for God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of of a sound mind. I am not going to be intimidated by you. You are a defeated bulldog. You are a toothless bulldog. Get out of my house in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you walk around and chest out and say, what does the day got to bring? I'm ready for anything. I don't be chickening out and be sleeping and crying. For weeping will endure for a night, but your joy is coming in the morning. This is what the word of God says. That's why you must memorize the scriptures. You build a wall of scripture around you that the world will not be able to tear it down. Any temptation Satan throws, it won't be able to tear it down because you have enough to fire back. When people try to mock at you and tell, look at your body, look at this body that you have, you tell them, well, have you created anything before? Before you come and talk about my body, try to create one strand of your hair and let's come and talk. Until then, get out of here and let me live my life. Don't let anybody bully you. You use the word of God to say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The reason why you are trying to bully me is because you are afraid of me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is the fearful side you are seeing. And in case you are blind, there is a wonderful side too you are not seeing. You are not qualified to be my friend. Just vamoose. Hallelujah. You use the word of God to defend yourself. You build a wall of scripture around you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So that you commit the scriptures to your memory and then you throw it right back upon Satan when he comes in with his temptations. It is written. It is written. When Jesus said the final one, the Bible says, and, and Satan departed. He went away for a season. That means he'll go away, but he'll try and come again. He doesn't give up, but at least he overcame. You see that he didn't call lightnings and thunder on the devil. He used his word. Let's follow the master's example. But what I'm trying to draw your mind to was that at that point of temptation, both Satan and Jesus did not have Bible with them. It's in memory. Even Satan quoted word for word for memory. We can't afford to be living below standard Christian lives. If Jesus memorized the scriptures, you must memorize the scriptures. And we can memorize scriptures. Huh? We can memorize scriptures. Some of you have memory, a lot of nonsense. 
You have been remembering all the worldly songs. You have them in memory. You, 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 you memorize the Buga song. You have it in memory. You know at which point you go down and which point you come up. But you can't memorize anything in the book of Ruth. Since you memorized Psalm 23, that's it. You have even forgotten verse 4. The Lord is my shepherd too, you don't know. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus too, you don't know how to say that one. The Lord's prayer too that you should at least memorize to that one too. When we get somewhere in the middle, you don't know whether did me not into temptation comes in before. You, some people pray the Lord's prayer and they mix it with the Lord is my shepherd. By the time they are praying, lead me not into temptation. Then he says that, where do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Like, you are a confused person. Satan will even look at you and say, look at this one to come in to fight me. What evil have I committed? That such riffraffs are coming to fight me when they don't know the word. When you know the word, Satan knows his place. When you deal with the devil, all witches and wizards will have to think twice before they come near your door. When a witch is sent to come and attack you in dreams, they will negotiate with their bosses. That Master, if I go to that house, the last time I went, she lifted her voice on fire, was coming, and I ran. Master, you have to go yourself because I, there will be argument until daybreak. Witches will not obey the instructions of their bosses. They may go and attack other people, but when they send them to your house, there will be argument in the satanic world. They will send their bosses. Master, this thing you have to, you, I can go with you, but I will be at behind and watch you go because this girl that is lying on that bed. <laughs> When she wake up and start saying the word of God says, the fire that comes from her mouth, I can't handle it all. Please don't send me on this mission again. Live your life in such a way that demons will negotiate with their bosses. And say, okay, this house is a no-fly zone. We are not going there. We will go to the next door, but not this one. Because you carry word. When the devil brings temptation whilst you are sitting in the car, you'll be able to quote the scriptures and speak it back. So surround yourself. I repeat that statement. Surround yourself. Build a wall of scriptures around you that the world will not be able to break it down. And then you are able to throw it back at the devil when he brings in his temptations. He does nothing but to cook temptations. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. So hang in your memory's hall. In your memory, there must be a hall of fame where you are hanging in all of the words of God and the promises of God. When the doctors break the news and say, you are unable to have a child, Say to them, thank you very much, but I know whom I have believed in. I know my Redeemer lives. This is not the end of the road for me because the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what I ask or think of. My destiny shall be transformed. God has done it before he will do it in my case. You know how to take your case to God in prayer and win your case in prayer because you have the word of God. The court in heaven will only listen to you if you are able to bring a convincing proof. Hallelujah. When we go to court, lawyers win cases based on what we call legal precedence. If the matter has been handled before and the judge has ruled in a particular way, you go to court and said, in the matter of the Republic versus Nancy Asantoa, in 1842, she used to live, she has now come to live again. <laughs> the judge ruled this way. And therefore, upon that, I submit to you, my Lord, it must go the same way. This is the way it has been ruled. And they base on that and they rule. In the same way, when you go to heaven, you go to God in prayer. You use the word of God in prayer. And you take it up to God and say, Father, according to the scriptures, there have been a legal precedence. In the case of Sarah, Mrs. Sarah Abraham, and the rest of the universe concerning her barrenness, you ruled in a particular way. And at 90 years, when she has stopped ovulating, you still cause her to have a child. I don't, the doctors have just told me this. I am only 30 years old. I'm not even 90. But because of the previous case, I come and based on the integrity of your word, rule again on my behalf. I know the case of Hannah versus the Republic. The, the case of the great woman of Samaria and that one. The case of Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. You bring all these cases before God and say, Father, this is how you ruled in those cases. Mine cannot be different from this one. Rule in my case, O Lord. And it shall be so. The word. Tell somebody the word. Lift up your right hand and say, Lord, anoint me with your word. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So commit your life to that. Decide to run a project of keeping the scriptures in Jesus' name. Sometimes keep a pocket Bible with you as you work and improve your opportunity to commit memory. 
to commit it to memory, it's precious promises. So these days, we have got a lot of things on our phones. But you know, sometimes when you're working, you are not allowed to have a phone with you, but you're allowed to have a notebook, a small book. That could be a small Bible. There are small, small Bibles around. You can keep that one. So that any little chance, you get a chance to just memorize even one verse a day. You start off from that point. Then gradually, you start memorizing whole chapters. It's possible. You are, it's, it's some of you, the things you memorize, right? some of the wealthy songs that you memorize, some that make sense and some that doesn't make sense. You memorize all of them. Then when it comes to the scriptures, see, this is too much. Some of you, the things you have memorized, if we put them all together, it's bigger than the Bible. You can memorize the word. Some people memorize insults. They know how to start from one point to the other. They just flow. They, they are very poetic and they just go from one point. Read the word. Memorize the word. Your brain is so powerful. There's nothing it can contain. Scientists have acknowledged that majority of people, 99% of people die having only used 3% of their brain. I mean, when you look at an aeroplane, it tells you what the brain of a man can do. You look at this big thing and it can still fly. And you look at all our luggages in it. Because they are big planes. Some of them can take 400 passengers. And with all of this, if you are flying a business class, you are, you are entitled to 32 kilos, one bag. And you look at all the number of people in business class having two, two bags. And sometimes they check one free for you to as concession because of whoever you are. And then with that, you are entitled to about two or three hand luggage. If you are flying business class, you are carrying this with you. And you carry, can you imagine about 400 of you like that? With all this weight on the plane, plus the plane's own weight, it doesn't matter. It would take off smoothly and fly from Ghana and come and land in the United Kingdom. And the mind of a human being did this one. You see the power that God gave you. We have underrated it and limited it. But this afternoon, the only point is I want you to memorize scriptures. Put all, dump all those Kanye West and all those mad people out. Instead, just memorize scriptures, read, read scriptures. Memorize enough scriptures. In Jesus' name. Let me end here because of the time. Let me end. Holy Spirit, I want you to pray in a short time, the next five minutes. I want you to tell God, Lord, help me to memorize the scriptures. I've seen the power of your word. I've seen that throughout the scriptures, your word also is Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of God dwell richly in you, richly, not poorly. You must let it, that means it's intentional. Let it dwell richly. Memorize, memorization. It shouldn't be difficult to memorize scriptures. But it is the grace of God. Some of us will memorize whole textbooks. Whole textbooks. There was a textbook when we were in secondary school. It was called Modern Biology. Me, I can, I can reproduce that book. So we memorize from preface. We were going to be very, you know, mischievous. We gather as friends and say, let's start Modern Bo. One, we call it Modern Bo, Modern Biology. We start off from, from even where the copyright statements are and all those things, preface, all that, then we start chapter one. Life. Life forms. And then you start memorizing, you memorize chapter two, chapter three. You are, if we can memorize set books, in medical school, you have to memorize, you memorize all kinds, you, you memorize angles at which worms lay eggs. You, you memorize all these things. We can memorize the word of God. 66 chapters. 66 books, sorry. We can memorize it. And you start from a point. Amen. And before you realize, you have a whole database of scripture, a whole bank of scriptures. And when you have a lot of that, you become very powerful. That's how you gain power. I don't know, am I preaching a second service? Okay, let's rise. <laughs> Please rise and pray in the name of Jesus. I want you to pray. Commit yourself before God. Say, Father, I've heard your word. I pray, help me. 
I'm helpless when it comes to this. I, I don't know. Anytime I try to read the Bible, I start falling asleep. It's a trap of the devil. This, this afternoon is a challenge. You want to tell us, I want to be that Christian. I want to be that young Christian who has memorized the scriptures. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Please anoint me to read the word and memorize a verse from this afternoon. I don't want to be the same. In Jesus' name. Kadala bashaba hayadaba. Bro so krondara baso kranda yataba. E la marando stabra katarababa. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The word of God is active and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates and divides asunder soul and spirit. And of joints and marrows. It's a descender of the thoughts and intents of every heart. Hebrews 4.12 The scripture says that God is a consuming fire. His word is a consuming fire. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, shakatala baba. Me lama sabranda yaba. One of the ways to memorize scripture is to sing the scripture. Sometimes you memorize it and create a song out of it and sing it. Makatala baba. I remember in secondary school we used to sing the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. We used to sing it. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I may not sin against thee. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I may not sin against thee. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. For your word is quicker than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I may not sin against thee. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. For your word is bigger than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. Your word have I hid in my heart. That I may not sin against thee. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. So, this scripture, two scriptures have been combined Psalm 119 and verse 11, and then Hebrews chapter 4 and the verse number 12. For your word is quicker than two edged sword. And then consuming fire, I think, is the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12. That God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, what's the last verse there? It should be, our God is a consuming fire. What's the last, the last verse in Hebrews chapter 12? For our God is a consuming fire. So three scriptures. It's quicker than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. Ah, your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. For your word is sharper than two edged sword. You are consuming fire. Lift your voice and pray. Oh, si barabala baba ya teri balababea. Oh, na la 
Holy Spirit overshadow these ones, Lord. Let the fire of your presence transform them to be able to read the scriptures. Give them the appetite to read scriptures. Create a strong desire in them to read the scriptures. From this afternoon, they will not feel the scriptures being boring anymore. I command that voice of the devil that shuts them off from scriptures out of their lives. And Lord, let them be able to commit the scripture to memory. Let them be able to observe and do all that is written in the word. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And let them be able to be beneficiaries of the blessings of the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody shout amen. Let's, let's receive the benediction. The Lord bless you all and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his great countenance on you and give you peace. I pray that every young person in our church who has visited us as well, everyone connected to this place, they will not die before their time. They will not die prematurely. They will not die suddenly. They will not die as failures. In the name of Jesus, by your great grace shall be upon them. You anoint them to be mighty men and women of God. In the name of Jesus, they will prevail and excel. This week, let all things work together for their good. In Jesus' name, shout amen. I say shout amen. Look at somebody and tell the person, commit the scriptures to memory. Because they are very powerful. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this afternoon and forevermore. You alone, you are blessed with irrevocable blessings to increase and to influence. God bless you. Bye-bye.